Greetings, Corpse Clubbers, and welcome to another episode of Corpse Club Horror BFFs. I am one of your Horror BFFs, Patrick Brownlee, joined, as always, by my Horror BFF, Heather Wixon. Hey, Heather. Hello. We are we're in for a treat this week, I guess. We've got <laughs> a, a double dose of fun. We are closing out our series on the remakes of 2010 with uh, a double feature. We're going to be talking about the remake of Piranha... And we're also going to be talking about the remake of I Spit on Your Grave, a movie we have been avoiding since January. Oh, and it's here. It's here. <laughs> we cannot avoid it any longer uh, because we are closing out this series. And so we have to do the last two here. Uh, but the exciting news that we can't share right now is we have something very cool planned for October. We do. Yes, uh, we've, we've, we've got some fun stuff a- ahead uh, during the Halloween season, so hopefully uh, people will enjoy that. That was the light at the end of the tunnel as I was watching I Spit on Your Grave for what I believe was the second time. I think I'd seen that movie before. I actually had avoided it, so this was <laughs> my first time watching it. And I think I've seen part two, because I had to review the DVD back when I was reviewing DVDs. I know I've seen I Spit on Your Grave 2. There's, I think, two more. I know there's a three, and then I think there's, there's a four. Yeah, yeah. A deja four, vu, right? Yeah, I think four is the one that brought back uh, Meyer Zarchi. Is it Zarchi? Is that how you say it? Sure. Sure. And Camille Keaton, I think yes. they came back for four. Which would like almost make it worth seeing, but I kind of know what I'm in for. Yeah, I think you do. But we'll get to that. We're getting ahead of ourselves. We should start with Piranha, uh, which we're not going to spend a ton of time on because those of you who've been listening to Corpse Club since its inception may remember a previous episode, perhaps during one of the summer months, on Alex Aja's remake of Piranha, correct? That is correct. We actually did a, uh, I think it was Vacations Gone Wrong episode with uh, Piranha 3D and The Ruins. Which I've never seen. I've never seen The Ruins. Wait, what? Uh, I've never seen The Ruins. I was upset by that worm thing crawling under the skin in the trailer, and so I never saw it. What? What? We, I think we should just stop the episode right now, and I think you have to go watch The Ruins. <laughs> and The Strangers, apparently. I just, I don't, who, who I are still haven't seen The Strangers. Oh, my God. Which means, did you ever see Strangers Pray at Night? <laughs> yeah, I saw Strangers Pray at Night. See, that makes no sense now. <laughs> well, no, I could still follow the movie. I know you can, but still. Oh, my God. I think it was something about the aesthetic. Strangers Pray at Night had that 80s aesthetic, and it makes it a, le- a little easier to take. Um, there's something about uh, uh, seeing the strangers. The idea of seeing the strangers is scary to me because I don't like home invasion horror. And uh, it's a much more like, quote unquote, realistic depiction of that than strangers pray at night and i don't want that in my brain oh my goodness uh it's amazing and you should watch it uh you should watch the ruins as well i will so, look i'm going to be pushing myself in october to watch a bunch of stuff that i don't normally watch so i think it, it, at the very least you should work in these movies i will try and add both to my list i think i own a copy of the ruins so that i can for sure add to my watch list in october I do not own The Strangers. Oh, my goodness gracious. Sorry. I don't even know if he could be horror BFFs anymore. Oh, my gosh. Don't say that. I know. I would never do that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So Piranha comes out in 2010, directed by Alex Aja, has an all-star cast uh, and adds the element of 3D. Uh, I remember very specifically declaring... 2010 was the first year that I was running F this movie and we were going to do an episode on summer movies. We were going to talk about everything that had come out in the summer of 2010. And one of the guys I do the podcast kept asking like, well, when is summer over? What's the, what's the last movie of the summer? And I very specifically remember constantly telling him it's Piranha 3D. We will not record this episode until I see Piranha 3D. That has to be included because I was super excited for this movie. Uh, And it, For the most part, I would say lived up to that excitement. I would say watching it again this time, the bloom was off the rose a little bit and I didn't enjoy it quite as much. Uh, But it's still a really fun movie. It is, you know, and I think, I mean, 
you know, the three, the 3D elements definitely heighten a lot of the aspects of the movie. Uh, it also sort of gratuitously leans into the boobies of the movie. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, you know, if you're looking for 3D boobies, you know, you really can't go. Hey, you know, and penis. It is an equal opportunity. That is true. But the boobies feel a little more in your face at times. Well, there's a lot more boobs than there is penis, to be yeah, fair. So, you know, but at least at least there was some sort of. You know, aim for equal footing for men and women. Um, <laughs> I don't know. The boobs are kind of sexualized. The penis is not, unless you're into that, in which case. Uh, <laughs> Look, whatever you do, who in the, in the I guess of your bedroom, I don't want to kink shame anyone. <laughs> if you're no. into Jerry O'Connell's <laughs> disembodied penis floating in the water, uh, <laughs> I have a movie for you, and that's. Yeah. That's great news. Um, yeah. The, the 3D also, I would say, helped cover up the kind of bad special effects in this movie. Yeah, it sucks because there are some practical effects. You know, those obviously are the those gore, are amazing. Yeah, the, the, the practical gore, effects are great. Yeah. And there are some practical piranhas in there, but they kind of get swallowed up. Uh, no, pun intended, did, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Um, by all the digital fish and the digital fish haven't really aged well, uh, um, no. you know. I would even, yeah, that's a polite way of saying it. Um, it's it's interesting to me how, like, sometimes I can watch digital effects from a movie from, like, 20 years ago, and things look okay. And then there's certain things, like, from, like, the last 10 to 15 years that are just really jarring. Um, and I, I would say the digital fish doesn't, don't do a whole lot of favors for this movie. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm also a big apologist. So, you know, I, I know that they were doing what they could with what they had at the time. Sure. You know, and if you can get past the, the, the weird CGI stuff, like, I think it's still a hell of a lot of fun. And again, through the 3D lenses, if you were fortunate enough to see this in the theater. Which I was. Me too. <laughs> uh, you don't notice it as much, you know, and if it's if they're designing it for that experience without really considering high def home video, um, you can get away with a lot more in terms of, you know, cutting costs a little bit on the, on the digital fish. It's just that then when you put it on Blu-ray or even DVD, it's like you start to notice it feels, uh, like maybe they went a little cheap on the effects. Just, yeah. just the, just the digital effects. Again, I want to reiterate the practical gore effects are incredible. Yes. And a few of the actual fish shots that are practical fish look fantastic, too. So like, focus on that stuff. All right. Um, I think my biggest mystery with this movie, and I never got a chance to find out exactly how, but like, like, what do you think the conversation was to get Richard Dreyfuss to do this? Right. Because like, I, I think for me, it is one of like sort of my favorite, like of the remakes, like openings, like that feels like obviously it's a tip to Jaws because he's wearing the same outfit that he's wearing in Jaws and everything like that. Singing the song. Um, singing the song, you know, and I just, I'm like, I'm kind of like, what, what did Aja have to say to Richard Dreyfus to get him to be in this movie? Like, I want to know that conversation. Like, was Dreyfus just in on the joke? Was he like, oh, you guys are going to do a fun fish movie. Okay. <laughs> well, like, it was an afternoon of work and a paycheck. Uh, who knows what the paycheck was, but obviously it was enough for him to put I mean, the hat on again. But, like, he pretty much had been, like, out of, like, wasn't he, like, sort of semi-retired at this point? I can't think of a lot of oh, stuff no, he's he wasn't. done. I'm sorry. He... He, it was weird because like he kind of he sort of stepped away for a few years, but then he started coming like because like last like, thing I kind of remember him doing because um, I know he did Poseidon, which I saw that at the drive-in. Oh, I never um, saw Poseidon. Oh, it's okay. You're not missing a whole lot there. <laughs> um, and then it was a few years till he was uh, Dick Cheney in the W movie, oh, and then he kind of right. came back and did a few things. So I guess he this wasn't really like part of his. He, he definitely, I guess, was working, but I, I swear I thought he'd sort of retired for a while. Dick Cheney getting eaten by piranhas. Better movie. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would I would pay top dollar for that movie. Really, that should have been all of W. It's just like they could have kept two thirds of the movie the exact same. And then in the last third. It's a shot for shot remake of the uh, chaos at the end of Piranha 3D. Or did the piranha shoot Cheney in the face? Oh, that would be fine, too, if the piranha 
learn how to use guns. That would be kind of cool. I I would be I'd be okay with that. Their little I could flippers pulling the trigger. I could totally I could see that happening. <laughs> I mean it's no it's no less ridic- ridiculous than Piranha Three Double D. Which I saw and cannot remember. It's at a water park, and I, and John Gulliger directed it. Those are the two things that I remember. I, it's a garbage movie, but I like it. <laughs> okay. I don't know how to explain it. I I'll take it. Isn't Hass- it. Hasselhoff's in it, right? Yeah, Hasselhoff's got some really funny stuff in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I it, might be leaning people... into the ironic joke a little too hard. Yeah, but that's Gulliger. Yeah, I guess. You know? I feel like Piranha 3D walks the line pretty well. Yeah. There's there's still sort of the the line of tongue in cheek, but yet ultimately like, holy shit, we're going to kill a lot of people where yeah, and everybody's was like playing it more or less straight, except for Jerry O'Connell, like Adam Scott, Elizabeth Shue. Everybody's like doing a very sincere thing, even though they know what movie they're in. Uh, and yeah, I feel like the casting of Hasselhoff is a little bit like, isn't this it's 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 putting a hat on top of a hat, right? Like, isn't this funny? <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know. But that was I, I think that was just sort of Gulliger's approach. Sure. I don't know. I need to see I it again. I, I don't remember it. It's like I said, it's a garbage movie, but I still had fun with it. I yeah. think I still have a copy of it somewhere. So but also Prana 3D has my girl Dina Meyer in it. May she rest in peace. Yes. Pieces. Pieces. She does not fare well in this movie. She's I, I would. I would argue wasted a little bit in this movie because uh, yeah. you don't you don't get very much of her. And then she's viciously eaten by fish. <laughs> well, I mean, that's like 90 percent of the cast. A lot of people are. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, I was, you know, she's one of those like sort of unsung heroes of like the 90s that I've always enjoyed. Um, you know, I will always I will always defend her and Johnny Mnemonic. I'm like the one person. But I'll do it. Uh, no, she's fine in Johnny Mnemonic. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think she was she should have had like a bigger action career, I feel like, because she was always really solid. Like, you know, Starship Troopers. Yeah. Because um, I just did something Dragon on Dragonheart. Is, is she in Dragonheart? She is in Dragonheart. All right. That's a which sweet I also enjoyed. Dragonheart pull. Yes. I actually just watched that like a, f- a few months ago for the first time. Oh, all right. I saw it I in the theater it and have not seen it since. And I don't think I've thought about it until just now when I had to remember that Dina Meyer was in it. <laughs> yes, I found her to be a delight. More importantly, though, she's uh, she was the older woman who seduced Brandon Walsh. 90210, right? yes. Uh, 90210. I mean, they kind of seduced each other. Let's be honest. I don't remember it at all. Oh, yeah, because she was the wife of his professor. Guy. Oh, my gosh. Scandalous. Yes. And I think they kind of just like sort of equally flirted. And then like they hooked up and I think it was then he found out that she was the wife of the guy. And On what so. planet is Dina Meyer older than Jason Priestley? <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. Are they about the same age? I would have to believe. She was born in 68. OK. Um, looking up I appreciate right you now. fact checking in the moment. This is this is why people listen to horror BFFs. She's technically a year older because Priestley was All born right, in There 69. we go. See, <laughs> give me a break. Phew. Phew. Oh, Hollywood is great, isn't it? Yeah, they're like, oh, you're an actress over twenty five. Well, you're clearly forty. Then. Right. <laughs> I brand you milf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking, by the way, you mentioned Elizabeth Shue. Have you have you done Cobra Kai yet? I have not. God dang it. I'm What's sorry. Wrong with you? I oh. have a, a podcast coming up that I have to watch a ton of stuff for. So every night I'm watching stuff for that. Once I get through that, I'm hoping to get to Cobra Whatever. Kai. Yeah, Whatever. Yeah, listen. And the strangers and the ruins. All I'm saying is when you give me homework and things to watch, I watch them. Uh, All right. Yeah, so I'm just saying. <laughs> just saying. Sometimes yeah. it like no. takes a couple of years. It does, but you know, I get there. <laughs> you do. I do. Fair enough. All right, so I got a yes. couple of years on Cobra Kai. Talk to me in 2023. Mm, you're not going to want to wait that long. All right. Yes, plus we have season threes coming out early next year, supposedly, so. Well, maybe that'll be my excuse. How long are the seasons? Uh, they're 10 episodes, about 30 minutes each. Okay. Yeah. When you watch the first one, you're going to be on like episode seven before you know it because you're not going to be able to stop watching. 
and not just because Netflix has that continuous play option. No, no, just because it's it's that addictive. All so right. I've actually I've actually almost thought about starting it again if I didn't have to watch so much work stuff. See, I just said I have to watch so much work stuff and I got yelled at. But I've already watched Cobra Kai. Oh, that's true. Yeah. See, there you go. Aren't, <laughs> are people at home are like, what the hell are you guys doing? This is not I spit in your grave or Piranha 3D. We'll get there, everyone. I feel like everyone. <laughs> is fine if we don't get to I spit on your grave right away. <laughs> we we got to no. get to it eventually. The though. person who's like on the edge of his or her seat for us to get to I spit on your grave should probably talk to someone. Yeah, probably. I mean, not us. <laughs> don't talk to us about it, I guess. Oh, it's going to be the stepfather all over again where I'm going to have to try to have a serious conversation with you <sighs> to be like, you're like, let's talk about this instead. Yeah, it's like... Uh, whatever. Yeah. Obviously, there's a conversation to be had about the Ice Pit on Your Grave remake. I just don't know that I want to have it, but yeah, yeah whatever. we'll get there. Yeah, we anyway, will. Anyway, let's we'll, we'll stay fu- we'll stay fun in the uh, the the um, the waters. I know they shot this in Lake Havasu, so that's why I just keep thinking Lake Havasu. Was it actually set? It's like set Lake Havasu. I don't know why I can't remember. I don't remember either. Oh no, no, it's set in Lake Victoria. That's what it is. All right. But they shot it in Lake Havasu. Okay. So, because I remember they actually invited me to come out to do a set visit. And they were like, but you have to drive yourself and pay for your hotel. And I was like, yeah, I don't think so. (laughs) Yeah, right? And I get to meet Eli Roth. (laughs) Look, I know Eli's a piece of crap. I've, I've met him a few times. He was nice to me, but that's not saying that I don't believe that he is a total piece of crap. So... You know, I don't know anything about the man. I just know what I hear. And uh, I've enjoyed several of his movies. And I've also enjoyed seeing him getting decapitated in this one. Yes, as well, so. that's I mean, that's a great part of the joke is like, hey, if you don't like Eli Roth, have we got the movie for you? Movie? Yeah, this should be like a, everybody should be playing this. These days. <laughs> He's playing a giant douchebag who gets his comeuppance. What is your favorite uh, kill during the spring break massacre? Oh, I don't even know if I, it's spring break. I'm just calling it spring break. But I believe it is spring it's break. It's got to be, right? What else is yeah, everybody is, doing yeah, at Lake I mean, Victoria? Exactly. Um, I, be, I I love the, the motorboat. Are we back to propeller? talking about boobs? Oh, got it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I was going to name that one as well. The hair tangled in the and and I like that they don't bother to show you how she got her hair tangled in the propeller of matter. the motorboat. It's like he takes the boat and all of a sudden someone's got her hair tangled in there. But it's pretty fantastic because it makes you wait a really long time uh, for the payoff, and you keep wondering, are they going to go there? Are they going to go there? And when they and do, they get there. it is spectacular. Yeah, I mean, because like uh, Amityville gives us a propeller scene, the Amityville remake. Do you want to talk about propeller scenes in a remake? Saw that in a theater and do not remember it. Well, that's on you. Um, (laughs) I enjoy it. Thank you very much. I know you do. I know you're a fan. What's the (laughs) propeller scene? I don't Um, remember. Yeah, there's a scene where towards the end where uh, they're in the boathouse and Melissa George gets her hair caught in the propeller. And uh, ultimately, it obviously doesn't go as far as it does in Piranha 3D. So she does not get her face ripped off. She does not. Different ending for that movie. That would be that. I think that's the alternate ending. Yeah. Yeah. And then she comes back and, ha- and haunts uh, Ryan Reynolds abs. Oh, wow. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. It's it's a big turn. It's, it's definitely a departure. That's ironic because Ryan Reynolds abs haunt me every day. Oh, me too. But in a good way. <laughs> Probably in a different way than you. Uh, no, it's the same way. Oh, OK. Well, that's good. It's good yeah. to know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, hey, he brought back Rick Moranis. So I honestly like I feel like the best person in the world right now is Ryan he Reynolds. did. He did. But then like something horrible happened that day. I can't remember what. I don't either. I just remember Rick Moranis. <laughs> but I remember being like, this was the day that Rick Moranis came back. It should be a glorious day. And yet here we are with X. I don't remember what, it, you know, in our every current day. news cycle. Exactly. It's like every day brings something new and horrible. So I'm sure that's what it was. Yeah, I, uh, I I don't even remember. It's it's all horrible. Um, but speaking of horrible, I also love when um, the when Ving Rhames gets attacked. OK, that's a good one, too. Really good. Really good gore effects there, obviously. But he uh, comes back in the sequel with like prosthetic legs, right? Yeah, he gets the, the Rose McGowan sort of treatment. Right. We <laughs> thought he was dead, but he's not. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, that's a good one. I also love the uh, the sort of jump scare at the end where Adam Scott gets eaten by the the big mama piranha. To be fair, we don't know that he gets eaten. I mean, it's it's <laughs> pretty. I mean, it grabs him and throws him in the water. True. I, Maybe it's just kissing him. That's true. I mean, it's Adam Scott. We've you know, seen that these dreamy. fish are very affectionate. That would have been a great jump scare if it hadn't been ruined in all of the I movies. Trailers. Marketing. I know. I know. They built so much of their marketing around that shot. And then it's the last shot of the movie. It's uh, it's whatchamacallit all over again. Oh, Terminator it, Salvation? No. I don't remember the last shot of Terminator <laughs> Salvation. What's the last <laughs> shot of Terminator Salvation? No, not the last shot, but they had like the, the reveal ru- ruined. Uh, oh, ruined, OK. Um, in their marketing as well. Quarantine. I can't believe that word wasn't uh, so ready on my lips, uh, given the times we're living in now. But the final shot of Quarantine, which I still have not seen. Uh, ah. But as I understand it, was in all of the marketing. Yeah, I didn't see it in theaters. I saw it after the fact. Yeah. Um, actually, I had to watch it because my ex-boss worked on it. So when they started working on the sequel, then I was like, oh, I probably should watch the first one. But you and said I it was kind of good, right? Yeah. Yeah, I liked it a lot. I mean, I, I love Wreck. Uh, I, I actually love all the Wreck movies for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I thought Quarantine was fun. The sequel, eh. Was that I on an airplane? Script, yeah, it, it, it's airplane slash into an airport. OK. Um, I think the script was actually better than what the movie ended up being. But ah. I it obviously went through some crazy revisions because it's definitely different than what I read. OK. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, and marketing is just and it's funny because we complain about it all these all the time, like these days about like how marketing ruins movies. But then, like, you know, going to the Beyond Fest. Uh, screenings and seeing like the two minute trailers that they show like bef- with like stuff from movies back like way back in the day and I was like right. well Jesus Christ I just watched the full old classic trailer for the thing and I was like well there's that whole movie <laughs> so I guess you know marketing's always sort of done that yeah I'm less offended by spoilers in trailers that only make sense if you've seen the movie yeah, because like, how are we to know? Right. Some, and it. sometimes you'll see a trailer after the fact. and You're like, oh, my God, I cannot believe they gave that away in the trailer. And then you remember like, oh, that only makes sense if you've actually seen the movie. But I, I for the most part, don't even watch trailers anymore. I might if it's a movie I've never heard of and have had like no uh, word of mouth on. But if I know who the filmmakers are or if somebody told me they liked it or if the title is cool or I know I'm going to see it anyway, I won't bother watching the trailer because I don't I'm, I'm going to see it. So why not experience that stuff for the first time during the movie? And, and I, you know, in festivals, especially we're coming off of uh, Fantasia Fest a couple weeks ago and. I would watch stuff just, again, based on the title. I wouldn't even read the one sentence description. And to have no idea what a movie is even about or where it's going is really fun. It's a really cool way to see a movie instead of being bombarded with ads and images. And here's this beat and here's this beat. And here's, uh, you know, reading reviews that give you plot synopsis and stuff like that. Um, I, I avoid a lot of that now until after I've seen the movie and then I go back and read stuff or whatever. But. Uh, it's been kind of cool. Yeah, I try to uh, avoid stuff as much as I can. Unfortunately, it's not always possible. Right. So, you know, it's it's tough. I have to walk a fine line sometimes. So. And I'm not always able to do, you know, when the trailer for like Black Widow comes out, I'm going to watch the trailer for Black Widow. Like, what are they going to ruin in Black Widow for me? Really? You know? Yeah. <laughs> she's uh, a widow. She becomes she becomes deadly. Right. You know, I don't um, know. Sometimes That's it's like, Black widow, right. Right. Sometimes I want to see what someone looks like in a specific costume or a specific makeup or, you know, if it's the Godzilla trailer, are they going to show Godzilla when the trailer for Godzilla versus King Kong comes out? Like, I'm going to watch that trailer, you know, hoping to see some shots of the two of them. Um, but most of them I try to avoid and it's been pretty cool. 
Yeah, I uh, did. Is there a Kong versus Godzilla trailer? There's not. Okay, I was like, did I miss something? No, I mean, no, I've been no. Kind of I'm off, saying when it comes offline. out, I'll watch oh, okay. it. Oh, okay. I yeah. was like, I'm like, holy crap, did I miss something? No. I know I've been kind of offline here and there, but like the last no. week, but you know, I was like, I don't, I don't know what's happening. Did I miss that? How did I miss that? You didn't. Um, oh, thank God. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's it's. I you know I it depends like if it's a bigger movie I'll probably watch the trailer right. um you know indie stuff eh, you know we'll see um you know I'm kind of wishing I hadn't watched the, the trailer for Freaky but I already know I'm in for that movie anyway and I already know what the premise is so right. you know I don't know if they're gonna I don't feel like they probably gave too much away on that one yeah so Everyone at home is like, wow, this is such a great discussion of Piranha 3D right Sorry, now. guys. We'll talk about I Spit on Your Grave in just a minute. <laughs> uh, Calm down, everybody. Piranha 3D cast member MVP. Because this is a cast. This is a deep bench here. It really is. I mean. And some I, of the people know, like Paul Shear, like wasn't really as famous when the movie came out. No, I mean, I, I, I actually enjoy Paul Shear a great deal in this yeah. movie. Um, he's super fun. Even Adam Scott um, probably wasn't as famous in 2010 as he would later be, you know, largely due to like something like Parks and Recreation. Those of us who are obsessed with Hellraiser Bloodline, of course, have known Adam Scott for years or watched him on Boy Meets World. But uh, of course. for a lot of people, uh, he wasn't necessarily a household name uh, the way that he is now. So the, it does have some people before they were more famous um but yeah who would who would your mvp be i mean i want to say it's the cocaine that jerry o'connell clearly had to have done throughout production when he made this movie um but that doesn't seem fair he's a little over the top a little bit um but that's what we love um you know i think it's actually and i'm god i don't even know if i'm gonna say her last name right it's jessica cesar okay um because i was a big fan of hers on gossip girl Oh, I never watched Gossip Girl. I didn't know she was on that show. She was. She was on for a few years, um, and I really liked her in that. So I was really excited to see her sort of, if I'm not mistaken, this is actually kind of like one of like her first big sort of film roles. So that was kind of cool. Um, I so have I a slightly her. difficult time giving a shit about the young lovers. Oh, no, I mean, the dude I don't give a crap about, but yeah. I liked her. Yeah. So and I guess I guess I didn't realize um, that that guy was on Vampire Diaries. I didn't either. They're both from CW shows. I had no idea. Yeah. Look at that. Um, so, yeah, I really like her in it. Um, you know, Ving Rhames is always fun. Yeah. You know, I think obviously Elizabeth Shue is, you know, always going to be a sentimental favorite of mine just because once I was dating a guy in high school who said, and his mom said I looked like Elizabeth Shue, and I was like, "What? Okay." <laughs> so you know, so she's always a favorite. Um, she's the best. Yeah, I mean, she is obviously, and of course, you know, Christopher Lloyd being the goofy science guy is always a welcome sight, as well. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think in terms of sort of main cast, I think it's Jessica. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that. Um the movie keeps I almost wish Christopher Lloyd had been had gone uncredited because that would have been just a fun little surprise halfway through the movie, because I do think the movie keeps being surprising. It keeps offering you new little things to enjoy, whether it's Christopher Lloyd's performance or the whole, you know, Spring Break Massacre or even down to that last gag, like all the way up until yeah. its very last shot. It keeps giving you little surprises, little things to enjoy, which I really appreciate. And it's amazing that the movie is as kind of funny as it is, because I wouldn't call and I've never spoken to him. But I wouldn't call Alex Aja's movies particularly hilarious. No, I wouldn't either. Um, but I guess it just shows that, you know, you shouldn't always uh judge a, a, a book by its cover I guess um, you know that obviously I, I think that's like when everybody can you judge saying, a like, book by all the other books the author has written perhaps but I think <laughs> it's a it's, it's a good thing like when like you know how like sometimes you see like a, you know because like for example like take somebody like Christopher Landon speaking of freaky um, the first movie he like he did that people really you know sort of knew him from was um, paranormal activity the marked ones 
I didn't even not know that was him. Not a, not a particularly funny movie. No. Um, and then he went on to do Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse. Happy Death Day. Happy Death Day to you. Now Freaky. Yeah. So there you go. I, I think it's, you know, it's I think it's kind of fun to sort of mix it up. And I think Aja himself has had a really varied career. If you if you look at the movies he's done, I mean, I know you haven't seen Mirrors, <laughs> <laughs> so we can't talk about Mirrors. Um, but if you I mean, if you look at like High Tension, The Hills Have Eyes remake, um, you know, Piranha 3D and then look at something like Horns, which is very sort of gothic horror romance. Um, I wish I liked I Horns more than I do. It's a mess. There's yeah. a lot of thing I, a lot of things I like about it. I've never read the book either, so I have nothing to compare it to. But I, I really wanted to like it, and I was like, eh, it's okay. It's not bad, but I don't love it. Yeah, I don't know if you ever saw the Ninth Life of Louis Drax. I don't think I did. I remember that being one of his. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that was a tough one. I actually had to go in and do notes for that movie. Oh wow! And I was like, ah. Uh, that Should was, your first note one. be, what if he only had five lives? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, you know, so that was kind of a, a downer. I also am not a huge fan of uh, Jamie Dornan. So uh, sure. I, I don't really care about that guy. No offense to Jamie Dornan if he's listening, which I'm sure he is. <laughs> Listen, we've been bit by that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have. <laughs> My apologies, Amazing. sir, if you're listening. <laughs> Yes, yes, you have. Yes, you have. Um, but then, he co- but then Aja comes back and does crawl. Oh my gosh, I forgot that was him. Yeah, dude. So, oh, sorry, my dog just kind of freaked out because he got right. excited about crawl. Dog's very excited um, about crawl. He should be because the dog lives. That's sorry, right. Spoiler. That's right. Um, but yeah, so I mean, if you look at Aja's like sort of filmography, like he's been sort of a director who's never really pigeonholed himself even though maybe a lot of us early on because of high tension and then the hills have eyes remake we we all sort of pigeonholed him for yeah you know based on our own expectations but if you look like i mean the guy's kind of like sort of dipped his toes in a lot of different waters if you will i will i see what you did i will make a case that i think i like him in piranha 3d i think crawl is spiritually the closest to piranha 3d definitely in terms of the gags and the sense of fun not just because it's about an aquatic animal you know trying to kill you um the way that it's put together I think in more of kind of a funhouse way, I think he's really well suited to that, which I wouldn't have guessed early on in his career. I thought of him more as kind of this French extreme guy um, based on high tension and the Hills have eyes remake because those movies are pretty brutal, but having had his body of work read back to me just now, I think I kind of prefer him in Piranha 3d slash crawl mode. I think I do too. You know, I mean, but I, I tend to prefer movies like that. Like, I mean, I like the Hills Have Eyes remake. I like most of High Tension. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's good stuff in there. Yeah, you know, but it's also you you don't come away from those experiences feeling happy or thrilled or elated. Or, no, you know, although like, can I tell you this? I still have this Erica and I still talk about this story. We were going to see the Hills Have Eyes remake on opening night. And we were a little early, so we were standing outside the theater, and the previous show had just let out, and so this family comes walking out, and a father and a son, who was all of about 10 years old, oh, like, no. they high-fived, like they had just gotten off a roller coaster. You would swear they were at a theme park on a ride, and they were just like, yeah, that was so fun, and they high-fived. And then I go in to see the movie, and the whole time, that's what's in my head. I'm like, what were they <laughs> high-fiving over? This is awful. This oh, is no. horrifying. This is going to scar that kid. All I could think about was them high-fiving like they had been on this fun ride, and that's not what that movie is. Yeah, I, I, I sat next to a kid... I, I would guess maybe six because he was very small. So he was like, but he wasn't like toddler, um, like maybe somewhere between six and eight uh, at the Devil's Rejects. Oh, my God. Some in the I don't know if it was his mom, whoever, but there was him and his woman sitting next to us. And I was like, I cannot believe this little kid is in a Rob Zombie movie. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm I'm all for like, hey, let's throw kids in a horror 
But like the devil's rejects at that late age. Yeah. Is, that's a lot. Well, at four, he had seen House of a Thousand Corpses and really liked it. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, different strokes, different folks. <laughs> what am I going to say? Let's go see those characters you love. One of them's a clown. <laughs> <laughs> I just keep thinking of the Sid. Am I, am I funny? I'm sorry. I just keep thinking of the Sid, the clown seed from that. Now that you said, yeah. pointed out the cloud part, clown yeah. part. Yeah. That's why the kid was there. Uh, anything else we want to say on Piranha 3D? Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think we've kind of said it because one, we covered it a ton before. Um, but yeah, it's still fun. It still holds up. I think it's probably one of the better remakes of 2010. Yes, I would agree with that. Having seen all of them. Yeah, we could do like a little rundown at the end of this episode now that we're, we're coming to the, 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 the finish line. OK, I like this plan. So. Yes, but I think it's definitely one of the better ones. Well, then let's move on to the movie everyone's here to talk about. Yes. Which is uh, the remake of I Spit on Your Grave. Um, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. I, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in feet first. So right. why not? Um, so the original movie... Um, I told this story on our Craven Craven podcast where uh, me and my ex, when we were dating in high school, one night we rented the last house on the left and we were like, sure, why not? It's Wes Craven. I've never seen it. Let's do this. And that was a miserable viewing experience. Um, several weeks later, we rented uh, the original I Spit on Your Grave. So if you thought it couldn't get any worse after like you just started to date somebody and you have to sit through last house on the left, uh, I spit on your grave is like 5,000 times worse because there was just, it was yeah. just a, it was just an experience, um, is the best way to put it. Um, so I think we got a little more particular about the movies we rented after that. I think the next one was like interview with a vampire. <laughs> we were like slightly less traumatizing. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so I haven't seen the original I Spit on Your Grave um, since I was a senior in high school. I will never. I, I know there's fans. That the, the movie has fans. Um, and I think, you know, obviously Myers Archie, if that's how you say it. If not, somebody please let me know on the Internet. Um, you know, I think he what he set out to do with that movie. I think he was very successful at and yeah. I think Camille Keaton. Um, is astonishingly great in that movie. It obviously, you know, earned sort of her place in cinematic history. Um, but it's a movie I don't really ever want to watch again. Um, I do think when it comes to the remake, I, I, I think to a degree, it does certain aspects of the original a little better or a little more palatable, I guess is the best way to put it. But none of it's palatable anyway. Um so that's like sort of the, the nice part of it <laughs> well, for me. Uh, I think the problem is in making it more palatable, I think it makes it less palatable. Because part of the effectiveness of the original, which I too have not seen in many, many years, and I'm the wrong person to be speaking to the power of the rape revenge subgenre. I know that there are writers on the internet who have talked about it a lot and who swear by it and say that, you know, it, uh, it's a movie that gave them strength. Um, I'm not in that position. Uh, so I don't want to necessarily speak to the whole rape revenge subgenre, but I just, in making it slicker because everybody is doing good work. The actors are all giving good performances with maybe the exception of the the guy who's kind of developmentally disabled and like uh, that's Chad Lindbergh, yes. Chad Lindbergh, who I recognize from other stuff. And it's not his fault. He's kind of asked to play an impossible part. Oh, he's in the original Fast and Furious. That's why I recognize him. Yeah. Um, he's kind of asked to play an impossible part that you just watch and you cringe because you're just like, really, we're still doing that in 2010. But OK, uh, the direction is solid the cinematography is good you know it's like everybody's doing good work but nobody really stopped to ask themselves why why are we doing this because the power of the original comes from the fact that it feels like it's made by maniacs with cameras 
Yeah. That it's made by crazy people capturing something that they shouldn't. And this feels like a calculated attempt to commercialize something that shouldn't be commercialized down to the poster, which is like the backside of the star Sarah Butler, you know, yeah. uh, wearing very skimpy underwear because that's the iconic image from the original I Spit on Your Grave. Trivia. Yes. Are you about to talk about what I think you're about to talk about? That that's Demi Moore. Demi Moore. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's... I, I did not realize that until like a year or two ago. I think I heard Charles Band uh, tell that story. Oh. And I think that's how I found out. And it's like one of the only things I've ever believed that Charles Band said. Um, I don't really pay attention when Charles Band talks. <laughs> well, right, exactly. Um, but and, and the fact that there's sequels like this is this is this is messed up because what you're saying is you're turning this into a franchise and the appeal for the franchise is a woman is going to be horribly, brutally raped and then she's going to kill people. And I understand maybe there's some degree of satisfaction in that, but that's what you're coming for. I remember when Wild Things turned into a straight to video franchise and it yeah. was like they're building this whole thing around the fact that at some point three actors are going to pretend to have sex together. But like, why do we care in 2005 and 2007, whenever these movies were made, why porn exists? Why do I care that like these three actors are going to pretend to have sex with each other? Why do I need to watch a 90 minute movie built around this one scene? That is the reason that a franchise exists. The only reason that we continue to make wild things sequels is because in each of them, actors are going to pretend to have sex. And that's the same with this I Spit on Your Grave franchise. Like, we're going to have people act out horrible rape at some point in this movie. And then we're going to have bloody, violent revenge. And maybe the one justifies the other. Maybe, you know, you are of the belief that, like, well, the fact that she gets revenge in the second half uh, makes it worth it to sit through the awfulness of the first half. We will have to agree to disagree on that if you are of that mindset, because to me, um, nothing makes it worth what we see Sarah Butler go through in this movie. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously, you know, a movie like Revenge gets it a little better. I really than this like one revenge. Does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I, it's, it's not about the extremity of it. If that makes it, even though it's very extreme in, in, in sort of how they approach it, you know, that movie approaches the violence. It's also talking it just, about things other than just the act of rape. It's talking about various exactly. kinds of horrible men and masculinity. Uh, it's talking about, gender dynamics. I mean, it has a lot of stuff on its mind besides just, oh, and someone's going to get raped. Yes. And I think for me, because I had actually had not, uh, you know, I, I skipped this movie when it came out, um, you know, even though um, I do know Sarah Butler in real life um, and she's very nice. She's very lovely. And she's um, really good in this movie. I feel bad for really her. Good in it. <laughs> I watch it I do too. feeling pity for her. I feel like she sort of, uh, Deserves a little better. Yeah. To be honest. And, you know. And she's I, in one of the sequels, too, right? Yes, I believe she's in three because two is a totally different thing. And then I think she comes back for three and then four is the original. Yeah, she's in three. Kinda. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I feel like she just kind of deserved a little bit better out of this. Um, and, you know, so it's 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 not comfortable and it's just. <sighs> I'm trying to figure out how to, you know, say good things about it. Well, we is don't have to say good what, things about it if we is, didn't like it. It's, I know. I know. But it's like, is this what you felt like with the stepfather? Is this what I'm experiencing no, right now? No, because the stepfather was such a nothing. It was like. Yeah, it's true. It's a nothing of a movie. This movie, I feel like, is actively frustrating to me. Um, because, again, I don't think anybody 
asked themselves why. Nobody said, why are we going to remake this now? What new do we have to say about this particular story uh, that we want to add? And it's yeah, all about... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, it almost would have made sense if they were doing this because of the one guy who uh, films everything. I think it's the Stanley character. Yeah. And, you know, so if they would have made it sort of a statement on like revenge porn or something, you know, not right. that it's porn because it is rape, but it's like something of like sort of, you know, how we've been so obsessed with filming aspects of our lives. You know, what do you do? You know, how does this then, you know, how can you do use this and use it against somebody like there should have been something that that is a plot point that I was like, OK, this is interesting because you have a guy recording this, which obviously it's the stupidest idea. And I'd almost be like, well, who would who would record such a thing? And, you know, that they're doing these horrible things. And I'm like, oh, looking at where we're at 10 years later, I'm like, oh, everybody would because yeah, we're all right. idiots. Every fraternity. Right? Pretty much. Um, you know, so I think there there was an opportunity to make that something that could have been different, that could have been impactful. And then it just isn't like. Because, again, they're too busy uh, trying to say, like, hey, remember the original? Remember that being, uh, hey, a guy got his dick cut off in that movie. Um, we're also going to cut off a dick in this movie and then we're going to feed it to him because we're extreme. Yes. Uh, by the way, both of these movies that we're talking about, I just put it together. Feel a uh, feel a feature. Uh, castration. Piece. Yeah. 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 Well, there you go. That get eaten. Who knew? See? Yeah, that's that's our theme. The <laughs> eating penises, everyone. Yes. Welcome to Horror BFFs, eating dicks. <laughs> that's what we do. That's what we do best, kids. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's funny because, like, I didn't even realize until about 30 minutes into the movie that the one guy is uh, our beloved Rodney Easton for Nightmare 3. Yeah. And some of four. And I was like, wait, what? And I was like, no, he shouldn't be in this. What yeah. is he doing? Again, getting paid. So that's fine. Um, and I also feel like Tracy Walter, who just seems like an angel, um, <laughs> deserves better than this as well. They could have at least given him teeth. Right. Like, I'm just so over like, OK, I, I get it. Like my family's from West Virginia. We're all a bunch of hillbillies. Like, it's fine. But I'm so over the the whole backcountry. Right toothless inbred sort of stereotype like they have dentists you know in small communities like i just i don't know although teeth does become a motif in this movie true yeah that's very disturbing every time they talk about the teeth um here's something and and maybe i'm misremembering the original film because like i said it's been 20 years since I saw it, maybe. Um, the second half of the movie, once the Sarah Butler character falls off the bridge and kind of disappears while they're trying to kill her post rape, um, she kind of disappears from the movie, except to pop up as sort of a boogeyman almost the way that a slasher movie is structured and yes. suddenly the film is about these men under attack by this woman rather than being about her experience of tracking them down something about that rubs me wrong and again maybe the original movie is structured the exact same way i truly cannot remember but no, to me it's, it's different because like in the original movie it's which i always thought was weird it, it that i believe it takes place like a few days after the rape um, where this is like, it's set a month later, mm -hmm. um, you know? And so, and it's weird because like, I, and that's the one thing I always thought was weird, like about the original I spit in your grave was that she was, you know, Camille's character was able to sort of lure these men back in. And at no point they had any sort of, they, they, they never gave that pause. Right. Like you brutally attack this woman and try to leave her for dead. And you're like, but she now wants to have sex with me, so I'm going to go do that. Right. Like, it just, that to me never really gelled. Because, like, I, if I'm doing something horrible, I'm trying to get away from that. Like, I just, I, I mean, I know men are dumb, but, like, are they that dumb? Yeah. 
I mean, I guess. I think, you know, I think maybe. I mean, there's a case to be made, but uh, yeah, and this movie doesn't do that. She kind of knocks each of them out and then goes through like a yeah, where a this one she's more like torture yeah. uh, scenario where it's like, are you going to get your eyelids pinned back or are you going to get a shotgun shoved up your butt? Or face and lie. That's that's another one. Right, right. Um, I mean, I will say the the I, I was very impressed uh, with the fish hook scene because one that is such an incredibly hard effect to pull off, like for real. Yeah. Because your eyelids are not a whole lot of you right. don't have a whole lot to work with there. Right, right, right. And so that you know that to me actually looked really cool and i was like oh my god and then the crows come by and pick his eyes because she rubs fish in them um yeah it just it seems like obviously they were sort of you know for the remake of i spit on your grave they were starting to go a little saw with it but the difference is is what they don't understand with saw movies and i will always i'm like i always feel like i'm beating my head against the wall with the saw movies but like jigsaw's not actively killing people in those movies He's putting them through a torturous experience. Right. But he one, he doesn't really want to kill people. And it's more of a morality play where there's no morality in this. Like it's setting up these things. So ultimately people will die. Right. And die violently. Right. Um, you know, which, again, I'm not saying these characters don't deserve violent deaths. But like, you know, it's it just it feels very 2010 as a response to the remake craze and saw definitely to me. definitely and, and that's the thing it's like the the decision to commercialize rape i think is what is is bothering me so much yeah and i will say like it was really strange because like i guess i didn't realize like how long it had been since i'd seen like an anchor bay logo at the beginning of a movie <laughs> and it made me a little nostalgic because i was like oh Oh, yeah, Anchor Bay. Yeah. Those they guys. Were, they were the best for a long time. They were. I mean, they, I, I don't think they do anything anymore. Right? No, no I don't no. think so. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. They got bought out so, by stars, right? Yeah, and then they became part of Lionsgate. So yeah. rest in peace, Anchor Bay. R.I.P. But I like Lionsgate still. Yeah, you know. <laughs> they're not. Good, they got, they're not what they were in the in the first decade of the two thousands, but they look, still do some good stuff. My major issue with them is that they were like, "Oh, we broke out with Saw. We're gonna make a shit ton of money off of Saw," and then all of a sudden they were like, "Hey, we got the rights to Hunger Games. Wasn't that them?" Uh, and yeah. they were like, "And they were like, we don't need Saw anymore." And then they tried to basically degrade, you know, treat yeah. horror as like sort of the second rate trash. And then ultimately the Hunger Games movies finished and they were like, oh, OK, now we have no identity because Expendable movies are done. The Hunger Game movies are done. We you know, basically ran Saw into the ground and now they're coming back with a new Saw. Yeah. Because, you know. Eventually. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> we'll get there one of these days. Yeah. Maybe. So, but yeah, I, you know, it's, it, there, there's, you know, there's a certain fondness I feel when I see like the old... Lionsgate logo, because then they got all the fancy Lionsgate logo then. Right. Because they got rid of the, you know, the gears and stuff. And they're like, now we're fancy Lionsgate. But I do get nostalgic for the old Anchor Bay logos and, you know, and for the the old Lionsgate. You know, it represents a good era. Era. And uh, modern horror. Yeah. And Anchor Bay, like before they were putting out original stuff necessarily they were just cranking out like catalog dvds of every horror movie you want to own was an anchor bay title you know oh yeah yeah that's actually the reason i ended up being able to own phenomena slash creepers for yeah. the first time on dvd was because of them yeah. so i appreciate that they put I think that's the, big fancy I gonna... sets for like opera and suspiria they had like soundtrack cds and everything they were like three disc they were so nice yeah, they were they were good because I think I got like the bare bones of that, and I think Tenebra. Okay. Way back in the day, I think if I'm not mistaken, or maybe I got some. I can't remember. Um, but either way, going back to I spit in your grave, which we're just so do we have to? to, to <sighs> you know, we have a job. <laughs> um, I will say that I uh, I very much the 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 meanie part of me really enjoyed the whole her going to the uh, sheriff's house bit. Okay. 
Um, I mean, if nothing else, I mean, obviously she didn't do anything to his family. Right. But I like that it got just dangerous enough. I think that's for me is like where the line should have been to a degree where it's like, obviously these guys deserve it. But like her doing the things that she does in this movie sort of negates the other. But again, I'm, you know, I don't know. It's Well, it leads to like the one sort of interesting exchange where he says, like, you know, she's my daughter. She's an innocent. And she says, well, so was I. And it does actually force him to consider some of his actions more than I think any of the like jigsaw other shit does. Too. Right. Yeah. Or, I mean, no, I think, or the other characters really did either. Oh, yeah. No, not at all. I mean, the one guy is just defiant the whole time, which I kind of think is smart to have at least one character who is like that, who doesn't necessarily buckle because he's just that much of an asshole that he can't believe that he's in this situation like the reality won't even set in that a woman has him in this situation and that he's not getting out like his brain won't allow him to believe that so he just remains defiant to the very end when he's eating his penis yes um do you do you find speaking of of assholes do you find the shotgun scene really realistic because i don't know would that really i feel like at some point the bullet would get lodged somewhere before coming uh, yeah. out of his mouth and shooting the other guy? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe not with a shotgun. I don't know enough about guns, but with a shotgun, maybe there's enough force to just kind of take the front of his head off and land in the other guy's chest. I mean, it, what I appreciated about it was that I didn't have to sit through another trap scene. <laughs> it just took two of them out at once, and I, I liked that. See, it's funny when you say trap scene, it just makes me think of trap music. What's um, trap music? So it's like EDM stuff. See, this is why Sorry. I don't. This is why I don't know. <laughs> I know. So it's like when you're like the trap scene. I don't like, know your hippie scene. music. Right. It's not hippie. It's all for the kids, man. I know. I'm cool. I know. But kids are hippies to me. Ah, uh, that's true. We are. <laughs> I'm technically younger than you, so you, you know, are. It fits. You I fits. You are. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say like I. I wasn't excited to watch this movie, but it wasn't nearly as bad. I mean, it's not great, but it wasn't as bad as I was thinking it was going to be. Sure. But I don't know that it was as good. I, it's like, I'm yeah, so well, like, that's right again. And that's that's exactly where I land, where I'm like, everybody did their job well, but nobody stopped to ask, should we do this job at all? Yeah. And, you know, I just. uh I know the director really hasn't done a whole lot. He did the uh, sequels, the right? Years. Well, he did. Um, he did the second sequel. He did the first sequel. Oh, he didn't do. He didn't do part three. No, and then I think the last thing I remember him. Uh, it's. Oh yeah, he did the. Uh, the last thing I remember is him doing the Exorcism of Molly Hartley. Which I've heard of, but not seen. Um, I had to review it, and I will tell you, you can skip that one. Okay. That's good to know. So there you go. I just saved, <laughs> I just saved you a bunch of time. Yeah, I don't really know what happened to him. He uh, kind of dropped off. Yeah. Well, hopefully he doesn't come back with uh, a, a 2020 grave, remake of I Spit on Your Grave. Yeah. Wow, that's funny, because I always thought he was a little bit older, but uh, he is or a little bit younger, but he's actually 56 years old now. Oh, yeah, I would have guessed this was more of a young man's movie. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking, too. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. We're both wrong. All right. Look at us. What do we know? <laughs> Nothing. I you like listening, everybody. Uh, all right. Let's run down the uh, the remakes of 2010. All right. Let me pull up my list. OK. What are we doing? Just best worst or are we ranking them? What are we doing? Uh, let me see. Where's my notes in my phone is all weird now. Oh, I appreciate that you have notes. I do. I kept the notes on this. All right. Yeah. So we have because we didn't do Clash of the Titans. No, which is fine. That's more sci- sci-fi fantasy. Yeah. yeah. You know, so we have one, two, three. We have six. OK. So. Yep. We have the crazies. Okay. I spit on your grave. Okay. Let me in. Okay. 
Nightmare on Elm Street. Okay. Piranha. Okay. And The Wolfman. Interesting. Yeah. I feel comfortable ranking these. I think I could rank. I could rank these two. What What is your ranking? All right, my one is Let Me In. Okay. Number two, Piranha 3D. Okay. Number three, The Crazies. Okay. Number four, The Wolfman. Okay. Number five. Much as I hate to say it, I spit on your grave. <laughs> and number six, coming in at dead last, A Nightmare on Elm Street. All right. Um, yeah, so I think my ranking would be uh, The Crazies at number one. Interesting. Okay. Yes. Um, I would probably, and I'm, I'm putting this on sort of like movies I return to often. Got it. Um, so I put Piranha at number two. Okay. I would go let me in at number three, but uh-huh. it's a tight, tight, you know, feel between one and three on these. Um, and then four would be the Wolfman. Five, I would have to go nightmare. Okay. <laughs> and then six, I spit on your grave. Yeah. Not a ton of difference between our rankings. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's interesting when you look at like the degree of, of remakes, like that came out that year in terms of like, you've got like the ones that hit these really great highs and then, and then, and then, you then have, there's, I yeah. spit out your grave and they ran on street. Yeah. Wolfman is kind of squarely in the middle where it's like some stuff really works eh. and some stuff doesn't, you know, but it's not a bad movie, but it's not as good as these top three. Um, and then you have, yeah, I spit on your grave in a nightmare on Elm Street. And again, I, I would put I spit on your grave higher only because to me it accomplishes its goals. I think its goals are gross, but I think <laughs> it does accomplish them with some degree of skill. And I think a nightmare on Elm Street just whiffs pretty hard. I mean, here's the thing, though. I don't feel gross after watching the nightmare remake. Completely understandable. Yeah, you know, I mean... I'm not going to watch either one of them again. <laughs> <laughs> so we, 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 we've, we've all emotionally moved on from those movies. I get yeah. it. It's, yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, but yeah, what a weird year for remakes. I don't even remember. I wonder if I have... Because I'm trying to think of like what the t- 2009 ones were. Friday the 13th, Stepfather, The Rest... The uh, rest. <laughs> <I know. laughs> yeah, it's a it's such a weird year. Yeah, definitely. Well, this was a fun series. Thank you for uh, doing this with me. Oh yes, of course. And thankfully, we get to wrap up the year with some some other fun stuff. Since yeah, then. we got we got something cool coming for October and November and December. Still up for grabs, but I'm sure we'll think of something good. If not, we'll be talking about Clash of the Titans. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't think we should subject them to that. Um, no. Although I don't mind part two, but, you uh, know. Wrath of the Titans? Yeah. Okay. I didn't mind Wrath, but I was really bored during Clash. Uh, I don't think I like either one of them very much, but. I mean, I don't love them or anything. Yeah. I'm not going to get married to them or anything, well, but, you know. think about it, I guess. Just don't rush that judgment. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a big step, so. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, and then we get to start getting ready for 2011 remakes, maybe. Are there some? Oh, of course there are. I, I know for a fact we have uh, Fright Night. Uh, I'm finally going to have to rewatch that one, huh? Oh, stop it. No, I don't even say that in, like, an angry way. I haven't seen it since the theater, and everyone tells me that it's good, and I have no idea because I haven't seen it since 2011. I, I had fun with it when it came out. It's never going to compare to the original. Um, but, you know, I think the worst thing in that movie was just using digital effects. Yeah. That they didn't need. So, you know. Well, let's save it for 2021. Yes. Oh, boy. Which is around we, the corner. <laughs> it is. Thankfully, we didn't start doing this in, uh, two th- or, uh, in 2018 because then we would have had to do the April Fool's Day remake. Which I've never seen. I haven't either, and I didn't. I don't need an excuse to do so. No, no. All right. So. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for listening. Uh, thank you to our engineer, Brian. Thank you to my horror BFF, Heather, who's the best horror BFF I could ask for. 
Uh, remember to go to... That's you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> remember to go to DailyDead.com every day for the latest and greatest in horror coverage. Go to CorpseClub.com to find out how you, too, can become a member of the Corpse Club and unlock special bonus content. And, uh, and uh, I guess that's it. Until next time, stay scary.